Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining today's virtual learning event sponsored by the Governance Standards Codes and Systems Unit. Let me hand over to the practice manager, Nikke, who is chairing this meeting. Nikke, over to you. Um, okay, thanks very much, Kalina. Um, good morning, colleagues. Good morning, um, friends um, from all the parts of the world that is joining um, these meeting today. Uh, my name is Adeni Keoyeyola. Um, of course, everyone calls me Nike. Um, I'm the uh, practice manager for the governance standards codes and systems unit in the governance global practice in the bank. Um, the unit oversees a couple of um, themes, including what we are about to discuss today, um, promoting governance standards. Um, I welcome you, everybody, from every part you are connecting to this distance learning event. Um, the purpose of the event today basically is to update us on two imp um, important aspects of the work that we do. Um, one is on the, uh, an update from the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, and um, the other is from the International Ethics Standards Board. Um, the meeting has been organized under the um, European Union Reparis Program, which um, is uh, funded by the European Union and is uh, under the management of the World Bank. What we're doing today is organized under one of the components of the program, of the EU Reparis Program. And basically, the component um, is in, uh, in respect of education and capacity development. So this is one of the opportunities to educate people on what is going on in uh, in some of the standards board that we are working with um so i mean let me say a big thanks to the european union funding this program and of course to our partners um who will be supporting in delivering um what we're doing now to really look at the context of what we're doing and the importance of it um we'll all agree that um Developing and implementing relevant and robust standards is pertinent to transparent and efficient delivery of public services. And uh, I mean, in every government, in every place, delivery of services is a core part of what we do. So what we're trying to do is to support, the financial, uh, support financial transparency in the public and in the private sector. And um, how do we do this? By ensuring their stability, by ensuring there is broad access to finance, by you know, ensuring that there's efficient resource allocation and sustainable growth. And you know, when we have the right standards and the right way of implementing the standards, then it's pertinent that all these key elements can be in place. Um, suffice to say that this links very closely with the twin goals of the bank. And these are a reduction of poverty and promoting shared pro uh, prosperity. And if we are able to you know, encourage stability in government, encourage access to finance, encourage efficient resource allocation and sustainable growth, then definitely we're on track to reducing poverty and ensuring that there's um, shared prosperity. So I want to say that as the World Bank, we believe we're in a unique position to contribute to the implementation of global standards by many countries and also very importantly we're in a unique position to disseminate the knowledge and information because we relate with i mean probably almost all countries all over the world so that puts us in a very uh, prominent position to be able to do this so this learning event will support dissemination of what the good work that is going on in iaasb as well as in iesba so um, the, the learning is open to both internal and external participants. So we have a couple of participants in the World Bank who are connected to this event. And also very importantly, we have external participants from the various countries uh, who are also connected. So again, let me implore everybody to please ensure that in the course of the presentation, you mute um, your phones or your systems so that there won't be interruption. Um, so let me go on to uh, thank and start by introducing, uh, of course, it's going to be just a minimal introduction because they will be further introduced uh, by the moderators of each of the sessions. 
So we have with us today Fiona Campbell and uh, Rich Sherko um, from the International Auditing and National Standards Board, um, who will be talking to us about recent developments in auditing standards. Also, we have Kim Gibson and Brian um, Fred Frederick of the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, who will also be talking to us about recently completed projects to revise and restructure the codes of ethics for professional accountants. Um, again, this is the first in the series of um, global learning that will be doing under this unit. And I'm really excited and uh, really looking forward to very robust and active participation. So without wasting more time, let me pass this on to Andre, who will be facilitating the first um, session, the first session um, of this uh, learning series. So again, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you. Um, Andre. Thank you, Nike. Uh, my name is Andre Gusuyok, and I'm Senior Financial Management Specialist at the Center for Financial Reporting Reform, uh, based in Vienna, Austria. And it's uh, my privilege to be here, and, and uh, I was offered this uh, opportunity to, to uh, guide uh, uh, part of this workshop. Uh, so this particular session will cover uh, two standards. One of them is uh, ISA 540 revised, uh, which is account auditing of accounting estimates and related disclosures. It is effective uh, for audits uh, of financial statements uh, for periods beginning or after 15 December 2019, and it was approved by IWSB in June 2018. And the second um, presentation will be on exposure draft on ISA uh, 315, <laughs> identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatements uh, that was issued uh, by ISB in July 2018. And we have two distinguished speakers today. Uh, the first speaker is Rich Sharko, uh, IWSB member since 2015, uh, and it was nominated, he was nominated by Transitional uh, Auditors Committee. Currently, uh, Mr. Sharko is a partner at PwC Audit and Assurance in Amsterdam, focusing on providing uh, accounting advice to financial institutions, uh, industry, and before that, he was member of PwC Network's Global Board. And since 2013, he also served as a PwC Central and Eastern Europe uh, Chief Risk Officer and Certified Public Accountant licensed in California. Uh, you can um, read his more detailed biography in, in the agenda. Uh, and the second speaker will today will be Fiona Campbell. Uh, she's a ISB w IWSB member since 2015. Uh, Ms. Campbell is a partner in uh, Erston Young Melbourne Assurance Practice, where she uh, has worked with a range of clients in retail, communications, consumer products, manufacturing, distribution, uh, and non-for-profit organization. For the past 15 years, uh, Ms. Campbell uh, has been involved in designing uh, EY global audit methodology, including insurance compliance uh, with both uh, national and international standards. Uh, and Fiona will cover uh, ISA 315. So without further ado, uh, let me pass uh, the microphone to uh, Rich uh, for the first presentation and uh, followed on uh, by Fiona, after which we will have a, a Q&A session where you will be able to, to raise your hand and, and, and uh, ask uh, questions that you may have. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Rich Sharko. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I could be here. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a, a good uh, a bit of education and, and a, any discussion on some questions. Um, um, we have a slide deck in front of us, uh, so let's move forward. Um, if we can move to the next uh, slide. If we can, yeah, thank you. 
Um, so just a quick uh, overview, uh, the project's been going on since uh, um, when I started as a, a board member, January 15. Um, it was originally set out to be a, a project only to update uh, um, and provide advice on financial institutions, uh, but the board decided that uh, the changes that were requiring uh, out of IFRS 9 uh, and, and other changes uh, probably required us to make more broader changes for uh, the uh, ISO 540 standard. Um, so we had a project unapproved. Uh, we had an update, uh, still a very useful update that's still on the system uh, that was done in March 2016, trying to say what pro project was aimed at. Uh, an ED in March 2017, um, uh, I think we had something like 69 separate uh, uh, responses to the exposure draft. We, we spent about a year talking about the, the, the changes and in June 2018, the board uh, approved the issuance of uh, ISO 540. Um, there will still be uh, this month a, uh, um, a vote by the PIOB to uh, 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 confirm that the due process was followed. Uh, we, we believe that will come forward and, and the final uh, uh, issued uh, standard should be uh, out early October. Um, I would say the last, uh, Point on that slide is not proposed effective date. Andre had it right. It is the uh, effective date in the standard. Uh, so periods ending on or after 15 December 2019. We'll move on to the next slide. Wanted to talk briefly about uh, some of the public interest uh, uh, issues that were identified in relation to the auditing and accounting estimates. So this was you know, why we're starting the, the project and, and, and as we went through the project, uh, things that were identified that made us think more um, how we can address uh, issues. Um, we you know, saw that there clearly were issues uh, evolving, increasing due to the financial reporting frameworks. Uh, as we've seen over the last five, 10 years, uh, the accounting standards have gotten more and more complex. Uh, clearly, the uh, economics in the uh, business world has gotten more complex with fair values, uh, uh, derivatives, just the how, how these things are all together. And uh, when you look at a, a balance sheet, a uh, set of financial statements, you, you realize that most of that balance sheet is uh, an accounting estimate uh, of, of some sort. And, and more and more, we see those accounting estimates with high estimation uncertainty. So becoming more and more pre uh, prevalent in accounts, that's another reason to move forward. Audit risks uh, arise, um, uh, such as uh, the auditing of estimates require significant management judgment. Um, and, and whenever you have that, you have potential for management bias and fraud. Uh, uh, as, as in IFRS 9 and goodwill impairment, there's more forward looking information that's required, more uh, related to uh, just the calculation as well as the disclosures of such information. Um, and, and as you can uh, tell, the disclosures as they were coming out more and more uh, talked about the measuring basement, uh, basis, the estimate, uh, estimation uncertainty, um, the data that's uh, being used, and the assumptions that, that management used to uh, calculate these estimates. Uh, uh, throughout the uh, world, we've seen financial regulator concerns on, on the complex uh, process that, that management use in making the uh, um, accounting estimates. Um, parts of that relates to the reliance on technology. Uh, parts of that uh, uh, we can see in the reliance of greater oversight by management. Um, due to the complex models that are being used, IFRS 9 is a very good example of that, uh, where for banks and, and, and complex institutions, you know, very uh, complex models are being used with many, many estimates, many, many uh, assumptions being used uh, to model out uh, what's needed to, to uh, drive the valuations on the balance sheet or drive the uh, credit impairments also. So we need to address audit quality, uh, was one that was also identified. Um, professional skepticism is always an area that, that, that auditors need to focus on. Um, as it relates to estimates, it's even that much more important. And, and as part of our project, we realized that, you know, for us to be able to uh, provide the most help to 
the auditors, we need to try to address how we can focus professional skepticism to focus the exercise of professional skepticism on the uh, creation, uh, sorry, on the auditing of, uh, uh, estimates. Um, one of the other things that came through was the uh, improved communication transparency that might be required. Now, with CAM in, in our audit reporting, um, it, it's evident that if you have a case where um, um, things that are going to the board, the supervisor, uh, in, de in determining the assumptions and evaluation methods being used, those are probably going to move towards what might be in an auditor's CAM and therefore uh, benefits governance and, and uh, regulators and, you know, see into what's the key aspects of, of, of the auditing of estimates. So we move on to the next slide. And a little bit talking about uh, the, the standard itself, um, and uh, you know, a very, very important part of, of ISO 540 uh, is our enhanced risk assessment. Um, what we are, are, what we've done is a much more focus than what was in the previous standard. Um, this will allow the auditor to obtain a better understanding of the entity and environment. And, and obviously including the entity's internal control. Uh, uh, very importantly, and there's uh, much debate and, and uh, agreement in the end, we introduced a separate assessment of inherent and control risk. As uh, Fiona will talk about later, that follows through when, when it gets into the ISO 315 also. Um, in assessing inherent risk uh, and in determining whether there is a significant risk, um, we need to uh, consider the effect of the inherent risk factors, another concept that's, that's been brought out in, in ISO 540, and how these interrelate to complexity, uh, subjectivity, estimation uncertainty, and or maybe other inherent risk factors, uh, which might be uh, um, a misstatement due to management bias or fraud. The inherent risk factors are very important, especially at the early stages of the uh, risk assessment. And, and you'll see them drawn all the way through um, the standard and, and focusing the auditor on why um, a, uh, a uh, estimate it changes, you know, what, what are the key factors in that. If we move on to the next slide. To a large extent, um, the work ethic kept the extent ISO 540 testing strategies. Um, uh, uh, this is important in, hello? Okay, sorry. sorry, I heard someone. Um, so it's important that, that people feel comfortable that the, the you know, testing management process or, or uh, checking subsequent events are still part of the process that you do to, to go about uh, auditing of estimates. The, more detailed part has come through objective-based requirements to respond to the success risk of material misstatement. You know, we still focus, uh, and, and there's more clarity now that you focus on the methods, so uh, maybe um, in, in including when you have very complex modeling, um, but you know, very much uh, on what the assumptions are and what, uh, what kind of data and, and the very uh, changes that relate to those and how that impacts the inherent risk. Reference is also made to uh, um, relevant requirements ISO 315, uh, clearly as part of the risk uh, assessment and, and then it's moved forward to ISO 330 as it relates to um, the uh, actual work uh, in response to the uh, identified risk. We uh, strengthen requirement on, on what management has not appropriately understood estimation uncertainty. So what does management really need to do uh, when, um, um, when they haven't done that? And what does the auditor need to do? Sorry, what does the auditor need to do when management hasn't appropriately understood uh, estimation uncertainty? Um, we, um, the whole work we've done on ranges is a, a very much expansion of of the ISO 540 uh, extant, um, both in the aim, uh, in the area of first identifying what is the, the range and, and what the factors are going into it, but very, very importantly also, because um, once you get to the range, it's important to 
uh, enhance the disclosures around that so people understand what are the factors that went in and what are the uncertainties that relate to the range. Um, and we've also clarified um, what the relevant uh, new requirements of ISO 540, uh, sorry, ISO 500. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. As I've said already, uh, the disclosures was an area up front that uh, uh, was identified in the public interest that we need to enhance the work we do around uh, disclosures. As part of that, we, um, we had a debate within the, the board and, and we concluded that we should change the objective. And then you can also see on the slide uh, the requirements um, and the evaluation to reasonable to, in other words, that the accounting estimates related to disclosures in the financial statements are reasonable. In the past, it was uh, what, what was viewed as a lower threshold of, of adequate. Um, and um, we've made consequential amendments to ISO 700 to uh, ensure that this is lined up. Um, we, we hope that this will be um, a, a uptick in what we look for in disclosures and, and what the auditors need to do to get to that, uh, that higher level. Clearly, um, as part of all the inspection results and, and, and discussions with regulators was the uh, estimates are a difficult area. And with, with this difficult area, um, uh, people want to be able to see you know, what, what documentation is put on file to support the audit work and, and potentially the professional skepticism uh, employed in, in, in challenging and looking at uh, management estimates and, and the assumptions that, that go through it. And so we have uh, enhanced documentation requirements. Um, uh, while it is an enhancement I, and, and will require more, more, more uh, uh, work documentation, I, I do believe it's uh, necessary in light of the uh, enhanced uh, use of uh, estimates throughout the match statements. Um, the application material uh, has been um, enhanced, expanded, and, and restructured um, to follow along the new requirements in, in, in the standard. Can we move on to the uh, next slide? As we, um, as we uh, uh, move on, uh, um, one of the things we realized with uh, um, ISO 540 was there uh, is an, a, an, a higher level of use of, of um, external information when um, considering estimates. So not only is it just information that it comes from the general ledger, uh, but also it goes to a much higher level um, 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 information from third-party pricing, um, other sources, central bank, uh, uh, data, uh, and many of these uh, things were, uh, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty as to what level of work, or what level of uh, comfort did, did the audit need to get to um, if, there, if the client was going to be using this in, in, in determining uh, accounting estimates. So um, we uh, focused our uh, changes uh, primarily is in, in uh, application material but we did change uh, and add a definition to make it clear that it relates to a broad range of users. We also uh, clarified uh, how a service organization and the guidance on, uh, in ISA 402 um, correlates to this uh, external information source. Um, there's enhanced uh, application material, as, as I said, um, and examples of what uh, that might be uh, an EIS. Um, other conforming amendments were made to uh, a variety of standards as, as listed on the slide. Um, those were, as, 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 as said, uh, more conforming amendments, uh, and um, uh, the biggest one in there was the one to ISA 200, which uh, uh, indicates the, the need to, uh, under 540, to um, identify uh, both the inherent and um, uh, one second. <laughs> Sorry, the separate uh, assessment of inherent and control risk. So I lost my thought. <laughs> um, if we move on to um, slide eight, 
um, throughout the, uh, the the whole project. Um, uh, I think uh, um, part of the discussions with uh, the SMPs, but also at the board level and, and in our outreach, was um, can we uh, can we well we have to make the standard more uh, enhanced to deal with all these. Uh, complex standards, uh, uh, accounting standards, but at the same time, can we ensure that the standard is scalable? Um, this was uh, no easy task, and we, we went down a number of different ta uh, paths to, to find out what might be uh, uh, a, a way to keep it uh, scalable. Um, we think uh, by uh, Identifying, um, it's already in our mind in the standards, but more explicitly identifying the concept of spectrum of inherent risk um, makes it a little easier to, to, to focus on that. Uh, trying to uh, build on the existing com uh, concepts in, in ISA 200, um, the, uh, the higher the risk, the more work you would do, and, and trying to bring that together both in wording um, and, and showing why we think uh, the, the standard is scalable. Um, the application material tries to go to that uh, extent. Um, one of the things that we are continuing to work on, uh, and the board has uh, um, asked uh, the or parts of the ISO 540 task force to continue on on and, and create examples and, and issue those uh, as uh, as guidance um, uh, as and when we uh, develop this information. We hope that that will continue to make the uh, uh, standard scalable, um, but you know this is uh, this is uh, an area that's uh, uh, always a focus of the board, and, and we and we hope that uh, through these types of outreach uh, events, we can uh, ensure that scalability is at the forefront. If we turn to the next page, very important um, in all of the debates and almost in almost every board discussion we had, we had a discussion about professional skepticism. As we talked about uh, earlier, the, uh, the concept of professional skepticism um, is really important in auditing investments. You know, there's so much uh, uh, management judgment, uh, both in the uh, selection of, of the method, uh, which data to use, um, and, and clearly on the assumptions. And so it's in, important that we focused on uh, uh, professional skepticism. Um, one of the uh, identified other potential inherent risk factors um, de deals with um, the misstatement due to bias and fraud, and, and that's an area that we look at to make sure that, um, you know, have we considered what could go wrong? So, you know, I think throughout the, the, the work, uh, as we talked about, uh, we put in a number of different places uh, in the standard uh, ways for the auditors to, to have to pause and think about it, its work. Um, various uh, application material on professional, uh, sorry, on possible management bias. Uh, we have a stand back provision. Um, uh, and uh, 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 used uh, in, in a variety of places, but we didn't want to use the word PS throughout. We didn't want to, to uh, um, uh, clutter the standard with, with uh, too many references to it, so we try to make it uh, precise. Uh, we also picked uh, and, and very, very uh, try to make it clear when we wanted that added enhancement, and so uh, certain times we use stronger language like challenge or question or reconsider. Um, we also made a conforming amendment to uh, I said 230 to uh, talk about um, or identify, not identify, to uh, point out that the uh, documentation requirements on professional skepticism could, could help uh, show how we've actually gone about uh, using professional skepticism. I move uh, to slide 10. Next slide. Part of our uh, discussions, especially with uh, certain regulators and, and, and members across the board, we want to make sure that uh, we increase the, uh, um, the communication transparency on uh, estimates. And, and as we talked about earlier, uh, depending on how uh, important the accounting estimate was and how much time and, and effort the auditors spent and communicated with the, with the uh, 
the audit committee, it, the item could end up being a, a CAM, and so that was an area that uh, was uh, already in um, in the audit reporting standards, but uh, was brought out in our account, uh, application material. Um, we also uh, included a uh, requirement to communicate with those charged with government responsibility given the qualitative aspects of any of these accounting uh, practices. We uh, in, enhanced the uh, conforming amendments relating to uh, the representation letter to bring out the areas that uh, the inherent risk factors, uh, data methods and assumptions, and how important those might be, so we make sure that those came through. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, it's important that uh, we keep uh, transparency in reporting of accounting estimates, both within the firm, uh, within the, you know, sorry, within the client and, and the uh, processes with the uh, supervisor board and audit committee, but also in our, our report where necessary. Andre, I think that's where I stop, and I think I guess the questions will come later, so maybe I turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Uh, so I, I would uh, suggest we go ahead with the second uh, presentation, and then we switch to Q&A. So Fiona, over to you. very much and um, thank you Rich as well for, for going through 540 and touching on a couple of the topics that I will talk also on for ISO 315. Um, so if we just go to the first slide and I'll talk through briefly um, some of the slides. There will also be some slides that have quite a lot of detail in them which I don't intend to spend too long on but certainly um, I'll draw out the highlights. So the um, the exposure draft, as Andre said, was approved at our June meeting and uh, was officially released in July, so some of you may have seen that. Um, unfortunately, because, uh, as Rich showed you, the timeline for ISA 540 on auditing estimates, uh, that wasn't finalised as a standard until that same June meeting, so we struggled to capture all of the conforming amendments uh, at the time, so we went through that process in, um, in early July and had a board meeting phone call in July and confirmed with the board that they were happy with the conforming amendment we'd identify um, as a result of obviously 540 now being finalised. Um, so that was made available in the suite of conforming amendments that we issued. You can see on the slide there are quite a few project objectives. They are just a few of the project objectives. There were lots, as you can imagine, in the project proposal. Um, and these were just uh, a few of the highlights, really trying to focus on uh, scalability was a big piece. Uh, lots of small audits out there that really struggle with knowing how much do they need to do risk assessment. The environment that we are auditing in is rapidly changing. The companies are becoming much more complex and so are the audits um, due to technology, for example. And then really uh, ref reflecting back on what Rich was just talking about, which is professional scepticism and really trying to enhance the application of professional scepticism when you are performing your risk assessment procedures. We have tried to clarify as well the, the nature and extent of the auditor's understanding of internal control. So how much do, do I need to understand when I'm getting my understanding? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we have also developed some non-authoritative guidance and tools, and we will look at developing some more as part of the implementation process as well. So with the um, exposure draft came some uh, flow charts, I guess we'll call them, some some graphics to try and help explain the standard as well. So I will touch on those a little bit later as well. So if we just go to the next slide, you'll see there's some consistency in the slides that come from the IAAFB. We have a roadmap as well. We like our road. And this is really just showing the journey that we've been on. We were a little behind the 540 guys. We didn't start until um, mid-2016, so 18 months behind that group. And we had our project proposal approved in September 2016. And then a little over 
18 months just to develop this exposure draft and get that out to approval stage. So I'm incredibly proud of all of the hard work that the, the task force has done. Our plan is to have a final standard ready for board approval in June 2019 at our board meeting. You'll see down at the bottom there. Um, timing is incredibly tight though. Um, really this with the exposure period we have, which is now and um, doesn't close until the 2nd of November, as I said, that means we really only have um, three board meetings, including the June 2019 one, to work through all of the feedback that we get and then have the, the standard ready for approval. So um, it is very tight, but uh, I would have to say we're up for the challenge. So we will try our best to try and uh, meet that deadline. If we just move on to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about what some of the things are that um, you may have noticed if you've read the exposure draft, but um, I won't be offended if you haven't read the exposure draft. I'm, I'm sure you're saving it for an interesting evening with a glass of red wine for all of you perhaps to try and digest the standard. Um, the standard is very iterative in nature. So, so what that means is when you're performing a risk assessment, you don't start at paragraph one requirement and then move to requirement number two and then requirement number three. You do tend to do all of the procedures um, and you jump a little bit all over the place with the standard. But unfortunately, the way standards are written is number one, number two, number three, number four. So in a very linear manner. So, um, so what we've tried to explain is how how the aspects of 315 are interconnected and you'll see with the flow chart that I'll talk about as well we're trying to demonstrate how it is all connected together. There's also about eight I think there are introductory paragraphs at the start of the standard and that's really to try and give you a snapshot of how do I how do I understand what this standard is really getting at what's the heart of performing a risk assessment so if um, this isn't a standard you're very familiar with, then perhaps um, reading those first introductory paragraphs will give you an overview of what the standard's trying to achieve. And as I said, um, there's a number of flowcharts as well, so those um, are certainly available on the IAASB website. I think um, there were some printing challenges, but if you download them first and then print them, it seems to work fine. If we just move on to the next slide, please. I don't intend to talk through this slide in a lot of detail. It's um, it's really just a placeholder so you can see very high level that there is a flowchart. And really what this flowchart is trying to describe is how all of the pieces of ISA 315 um, fit together. There's also um, a connection point, I'll call it. So on the right hand side of that slide, you'll see an orange um, yeah, my maths wasn't that good. I can't remember what shape that is, but it's probably the shape of a stop sign in most countries. It's an orange uh, symbol there. And that orange symbol is a connection point to another flow chart, which we have, which has got a lot more detail behind it. So there's a separate flow chart there, which is really trying to help you understand, um, I guess that far right hand box there, which is getting an understanding of the entity system of internal control. So I will um, touch touch on that slide when we get to that in a couple more slides but this is really the the overall ISO 315 flow chart and it's really showing that you start at the top with getting your getting your understanding of the entity the environment the financial reporting framework you start to identify some of the risks of material misstatement at both the financial statement level and the assertion level you then try and identify or work out what are the classes of transactions account balances and disclosures which which I as the auditor are concerned about and and then which ones of those are significant and therefore which ones have um, you know the relevant assertions that I am that I'm caring about and that draws you down into the assessment of inherent risk and control risk and as Rich mentioned in his presentation one of the things the board felt quite strongly about was separating the assessment of inherent risk and control risk and um, there's a number of reasons for that, but I think the key reason was when we were talking about this assessment of inherent risk and control risk, um, it was it was really trying to make sure that people weren't taking credit for controls that they hadn't actually tested. And if you separate them and have to think about inherent risk and control risk separately, then there's a better chance that um, that auditors weren't 
combining them all together and just making one risk assessment where in fact they were taking some credit for controls. You then may see on the um, on the slide on the on the right hand side there's a box there which has got a stand but a stand back box and that's really to make sure auditors haven't missed any of the significant accounts um, classes of transactions or disclosures and see whether or not there are any of them that may be um, material but aren't significant and I will talk about the reason for those two terms a little bit later it's um, it's an issue that's created by ISA 330, but it's really a stand back to say, now I've done all my risk assessment procedures, have I actually double checked to make sure I've found all of the significant accounts that I'm going to be doing my risk assessment on? And then um, you think about whether any of those risks that you've identified are significant risks or risks for which substantive procedures alone are not enough and therefore you're going to have to do some controls testing. And then that drops you down into that green box right down the bottom, which is ISA 330, which is, uh, this standard is on risk assessments, 330 is on the responses to those risk assessments. So this drops you into the requirements of what you need to do to respond to all of the risks that you've identified here. And I'm hoping that you can see that it is a reasonably iterative process. Uh, we've had, we've tried to make it a little bit linear to show you, you know, how the, uh, some auditors may think in terms of the flow of the steps, but it um, doesn't matter which box you're in, you can certainly jump above, jump below, jump sideways, um, whatever is the process that you have in either your methodology or the approach that you're taking to do the, to do the risk assessments. And while all of this is happening, you're obviously applying your professional judgment and professional scepticism and thinking about uh, documenting all of this as well. So um, it may look simple because it just has the one word documentation, but it, it is obviously a reasonably high hurdle. If we just move on to the next slide. Um, overall, some of the topics that I've touched on briefly was scalability. Um, we, the board made a decision that the application material, which currently when you look at ISAs, they have a reference to, um, to smaller entities in the application material, typically towards the end of the application material. Um, we decided to remove the heading and instead embed the guidance right at the start of each of the sections and write it in the context of entities that are both smaller and less complex. Now that doesn't mean that you can't be larger and less complex and apply some of this guidance. What we were trying to show was this, for the smallest and simplest entities, here's an example of how the standard might be scalable. And then in a number of examples, we've also included the opposite end of that example for large and more complex entities. Um, so that's really what we were trying to say. But at the end of the day, the requirements are the requirements. You just need to work out how they apply in your facts and circumstances. And certainly all of the the requirements are applied, you know, with the context of your clients in mind. The automated tools and techniques. So this was an interesting topic. The concept of data analytics is something that has become a bit of a hot topic for us as a board to talk about. And there was some encouragement to try and include into the standard this reference data analytics. And instead, where we landed was we have included examples in the application material which refer to automated tools and techniques. And the reason we use that instead of data analytics is for a number of a number of reasons. Firstly, because the term data analytics isn't actually defined anywhere and it's not necessarily understood to mean the same thing by everybody around the world. It's also used differently by different stakeholders. So some people understand data analytics to mean something different. And also, for me personally, I don't believe the term data analytics actually captures all of the techniques. So if we think about some of the techniques that are already being used, auditors are already using robotics to perform simple audit procedures. They're already using drones to do stock takes, for example. Those are not data analytic analytics as, as we, or as I would think about them. And so so we have used the word data analytics, I think once or maybe twice in the application material, but typically we refer to them as automated tools and techniques. We have uh, thought about 
fraud throughout the standard. We've been tried to enhance the connection points back to IT40, which is the standard on fraud. And we've also tried to highlight um, this concept of fraud in our introductory paragraphs, particularly when it comes to this new concept we have of inherent risk factors. Um, the fraud concept is built specifically into that. And as Rich said earlier for his 540 presentation, very similar for 315, we didn't want to just write, be professionally skeptical throughout the standard, that's not very helpful, but instead trying to build in some key requirements which are really trying to get the auditor to think a little differently and to, um, and to really drive that uh, professional skepticism. We move on to the next slide. Um, so the risk assessment procedures, one of the key objectives is to provide sufficient appropriate audit evidence as you'll see there and we've really tried to enhance that. We've tried to enhance the, the explanation of you know, why you're getting an understanding of the entity and its environment and thinking about needing to understand the business model and the use of IT in the business and by that I would say it's important to understand if this is Amazon that you are auditing and how they use IT as opposed to the corner tire shop where you go to get your tires replaced that maybe isn't using IT in the same way for their business model. And that's all important as part of the um, understanding the entity. And I think somebody probably want to go on mute because we can hear some typing in the background. <laughs> Uh, and then the last part on that slide is around um, understanding the applicable financial reporting framework and really trying to make sure that when you're getting your understanding of the entity, you're also thinking about well, what are the set of financials that the opinion is being attached to at the end of the day. Now, we don't think that that, uh, that last bullet point on there is really going to be an additional burden for auditors because I think most, if not all auditors already have in mind when they're thinking about their clients and they're getting their understanding, well, what accounts do I care about, what assertions, what do the financials going to look like and they will often use the trial balance or the, you know, maybe a draft financial statements, although my clients are never that organised and they start to use those as a way of starting to identify risks. So we think most auditors probably already have that lens when they're getting their understanding anyway. So if we move on to the next slide, and uh, I think you only need to push this slide one more time and you'll get a graphic that just slides in from the left hand side, I think it is, there we go. And, um, and this is what we call, well we nicknamed the risk assessment funnel and it's really just another graphical representation of, um, of how some people think about ISA 315 and how it you know, starts at the top of the funnel and you, you chunk your way down to the bottom of the funnel and hopefully as you step through your understanding of the entity, the environment, financial reporting framework, think about what accounts you care about, think about where the inherent risk is sitting and hopefully then out of the bottom of the funnel you've identified your, um, your significant risks. The significant risks is a term that we have modified the definition for as well. Um, you'll see that in a couple of more slides where we talk about it in a little bit more, but it's those risks that are, that are um, close to the upper end of the spectrum of inherent risk. We spend a lot of time trying to define that, so I'm sure as we get responses back from people to the exposure draft, we will get some feedback to that definition. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see that we have a number of new definitions and a number of revised definitions in the standard as well. The three on the left hand side there, it says new, but in actual fact they were lifted out of the existing glossary that we have and then we, uh, we modernised them to really bring them into the 21st century. Um, and really the aim is to try and to clarify, for example, the revision around the definition of controls, is to clarify how that term is being used. Um, the definition is really trying to recognise less formal controls as well. So if controls are your policies and procedures you have in place, we expanded it to include less formalised ones as well because there will be a lot of smaller entities that don't necessarily have formal policies and procedures, but you can absolutely see that there's some kind of policy or procedure or control in place because you see it operating in front of you. Um, so, uh, so that's what we have revised. You'll see on the right hand side the components of internal control. We have retained those five. They are the same five under XN as well and what we've done is we've also aligned them 
with uh, COSO 2013 as well, just to make sure that they can matched up. If we move on to the next slide, uh, the, the term controls relevant to the audit is a phrase that we spend a lot of time discussing at the board level. And there's a number of auditors <laughs> who, uh, who think controls relevant to the audit means, well, I'm going to do a substantive audit, therefore there are no controls relevant to the audit. And the board felt very strongly that in actual fact, there should always be controls relevant to the audit. At, at, at a minimum, you've got journal entries and uh, there is a requirement to understand the journal entries. So we have spent quite a bit of time trying to step through exactly what you would need to do, particularly if you're doing a primarily substantive audit. Um, we've taken each of the five components of internal control and what we've really tried to do is clarify exactly what do I need to do as an auditor to get my understanding and then what do I need to do to determine that they've been designed properly and implemented as well. So what I call in sh shorthand DNI, design and implementation of controls. And we've developed a flowchart to help with that as well. Um, the next slide, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, Andre, I think you're moderating these slides. If you push it and then one more time, so you'll see three boxes at the top, uh, sorry, two boxes at the top. The indirect controls and then primarily you've got the three little words in that one next to it. This slide is really trying to show how those five components of internal control um, feed into the system of internal control. So you'll see in the circle there's a CE, an RA and an M. That's the control environment, the risk assessment and the monitoring. There's those three um, components of internal control. And what we're saying here is primarily we look at those and consider them to be indirect controls and by that we mean not easily linked directly to accounts or assertions. So if you uh, push return one more time you'll get another box, another circle underneath it and what we're saying here is that often those controls which are those indirect controls often tend to be those at the financial statement level. If you uh, push return, I think two more times, we'll see the similar thing on the right hand side coming up. And these are the other two components of internal control being the information systems and the control activities one. And these components are probably more likely to be direct controls. So if you press return one more time, you'll see a circle coming in underneath where we're saying they're a bit more direct, they're often risks that are more easily able to be linked to those at the assertion level. If you click one more time, you'll see that falling out of all of these understanding of these five components, you will identify controls relevant to the audit that are responding to the risks at the assertion level. So you'll see the left hand side, there's a dotted line because they're sometimes a little bit indirect, a little bit hard to link directly to assertion levels, whereas the ones on the right, you typically can uh, link to the assertions. If you click one more time, you will see that we also get you to think about what are the uh, general IT controls that are relevant to the audit and we've included some specific criteria in the standard to help you identify those. And then if you click one last time on this slide, you'll get uh, a circle that's saying now with all of that understanding I've got and I've identified my controls relevant to the audit and I've identified my general, identified my general IT controls relevant to the audit, I need to go and perform design and implementation on those controls. Now that doesn't mean you can take credit for that. Um, you can't actually take credit or reduce your control risk unless you test them beyond DNI. But this is really kind of the baseline minimum that we would expect people to be doing around the system and internal control. If you go on to the next slide, this flowchart, I definitely do not intend to go through in a lot of detail, but this is essentially trying to do it uh, to demonstrate in a slightly different way the, the five components of internal control across the top. You'll see five boxes. And then what do I need to do with each of those boxes to get my understanding? What do I have to do, including IT? And then what do I do to evaluate them? And then what do I do from a DNI perspective? And then the outputs, which are the, the bottom three boxes, that's really telling me what do I do with the output of all of this understanding? And then that links you through to ISA 330 as well. So this is the flowchart that sits behind that orange stop sign, which was on the very first flowchart. So if we move on to the next, the next slide. 
This is the third flow chart that we've developed and you definitely won't be able to read that without going blind. Um, so I do suggest that you try and um, either pull it up on your screen when you have a chance or, or print it. And this flow chart was to really try and help the auditors understand um, on one page, what are all the things that I need to think about when it comes to um, the IT environment at my client? We're really trying to show, you know, you get your understanding of how IT is used in the business. So again, if it's an Amazon, then that's important to know. Um, you need to you need to understand the environment piece, so your hardware, your software, your personnel, your processes, things like that. And all of this information that you're getting and all of this understanding you're getting is helping you identify risks that arise from IT. And you'll see that on the flow chart towards the bottom. So you'll identify risks arising from IT. You'll identify the general IT controls that you care about and any of the IT applications which have got controls that are relevant to your audit as well. And similar to the other flowcharts right down the bottom, what do I do with all of that? That links you through to ISA 330 and tells you what you need to do to test them. We press return and go to the next slide. The next slide is really uh, just again another high level um, summary of some of the new definitions we have and some of the revised definitions we have. You see we have this new definition called inherent risk factors and on the far right hand side you'll see what those five inherent risk factors are. We have worked very closely with the ISA 540 task force team and uh, made sure that those five inherent risk factors are um, consistent with the inherent risk factors that they have in their standard. Obviously, 315 is an umbrella standard, 540 is, you know, what do I do specific to estimates so they don't have all five inherent risk factors in their standard, but the ones they do have, we have made sure are totally consistent. And we've also endeavoured to make them as consistent as we can with the PCA of the exposure draft. They've used slightly different words, but we feel they mean pretty much uh, the same thing when it comes to the inherent risk factors. We've made some revisions to the definition of sessions and also significant risk. As I said, the, the definition of significant risk is very circular and focused on um, what you did in response to it rather than trying to help you work out what is it that makes something a significant risk. So we have uh, we've changed that definition. The, there is a concept of a spectrum of inherent risk. Now, I, I, it's not a and not a new concept to the standard. I think all auditors understand risk falls somewhere from a low end that I might not care too much about right up to a really scary, scary end where I have to do lots of audit work. And so I think the concept is familiar to auditors. It's just never had a label. So we've now given it a label and we've called it a concept, this concept of a spectrum of inherent risk. Where do the inherent risk lie on that spectrum? And then that obviously helps you design what you do in response to it. We move on to the next slide. I've touched briefly on this new definition of significant risk and I did want to just highlight here, you'll see bold and underlined is the little word or and I just wanted to make it clear that that was intentionally used by the standards board. Um, it's not just about making sure that we've identified the ones with the highest likelihood and the highest magnitude. There were uh, several board members who felt quite passionately that if you think, if you look at that little graphic with the stars on it, often all we focus on are those in the top right hand corner. And their view was that um, there could also be ones that have lower likelihood but still have a really high potential for misstatement. And if that was the case, then it should still be captured as a significant risk and responded into as it responded in the same way as, as what we would traditionally have done, the ones in the top right hand corner. Um, I think it'd be fair to say I am expecting a lot of feedback on this point. We've asked um, specific questions in the exposure draft to get reactions to this, to see what people think about this definition of inherent risk, uh, of significant risk, sorry. Um, but I did want to be clear that the word or was intentional. It's to try and capture more items um, as, as significant risks. If we move on to the next slide, Rich touched briefly in his presentation that there is a new requirement to separately assess inherent risk and control risk. 
this isn't a flow chart, but it is an aid that we designed as a task force to help the board understand with what we were really trying to explain here. So you'll see on the left hand side, you identify inherent risk and then you assess inherent risk. And the standard requires you to identify your inherent risks and then assess them. And you'll see in that top box is getting you to uh, take a little bit of an educated guess as to where you think things fall on the, the spectrum of inherent risk and which ones do you think are going to be having a reasonable possibility of misstatement. So if I've identified them and then I have to assess them and that assessment is based on the likelihood and magnitude and I'm using my inherent risk factors. So I identify them and I assess them. Then when um, you, you have to think about control risk, well, I don't really identify control risk. Identi what I do instead is I identify controls which are relevant to the audit. So we've got the requirements in there to identify those controls and then you evaluate the design and work out whether they've been implemented. So you're doing DNI, and then the second box is you're going to assess that control risk. And you'll see there's a little decision triangle. If you're going to test the operating effectiveness of controls, then you can reduce your control risk. And if you're not, then it stays at the maximum. And again, this is all being done with a bit of an educated guess because until you actually go and test the controls, you don't know exactly whether they're effective and have been implemented properly. So I've identified and assessed my inherent risk. I've identified identified my controls and I've assessed my control risk. And then that obviously feeds down into the risk of material statement at the assertion level, which is at the bottom. But that's to try and show how we've split this, uh, this requirement now to, um, to assess separately inherent risk and control risk. We move on to the next slide. What else is new or revised? And you're probably thinking, surely that's enough. <laughs> um, as I said at the start, the stand back, that's really a, a double checking that you've identified all of the significant accounts, that you haven't missed anything. And then what we have is ISA 330. Now this is a particular paragraph which has caused um, quite a lot of angst amongst the firms and regulators and others. And we were specifically requested to go and try and fix this issue with ISA 330 paragraph 18 in particular. And I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially what 330 is saying is you've done your risk assessment under ISA 315, irrespective of that assessment of risk there, if it's material, you still have to design some substantive procedures. So if there's still a material risk of misstatement, ISA 330 paragraph 18 requires you to, um, to perform some substantive testing. And what firms and regulators were saying was teams weren't really thinking about what the best way to respond to those risks were when they got to ISA 330. And also the concept of a material risk isn't the same as a risk of material misstatement. So materiality is a concept at the financial statement level when I assign an opinion at the whole of financial statement levels. Um, so it doesn't really fit properly in this standard here. So we have modified uh, ISA 330 paragraph 18. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but basically saying once you've done your assessment of risk under 315, if you then look at them and you still have a risk which is either quantitatively, so dollar figures, or qualitatively material, then you need to design some procedures which respond to the risk. So let me give you an example. One of the balances which is sometimes, often, not identified as a significant account using this new definition is land, land and buildings. It could be a really, really large number but there's no risk in it. There's, there is no risk of material misstatement. So it may not be identified as a significant account when I'm doing my ISA 315 procedures. What 330.18 would then say is, well, you've got to 330 and you have an account that was not identified as significant, but it's quantitative. It's material. It's a really big number. I need to do something. So if I think about what the risk could be with land and buildings, it's probably the ownership piece or the existence piece. Like, have, does someone actually own that? It's probably not the valuation of it, and depending on, on the country that you're operating in. Um, and so I would design a substantive procedure to deal with that particular risk. What auditors have been doing is 
okay, land and buildings is material, I need to do something with it. I'll just test the easiest thing to do, which makes no sense whatsoever to do, which is maybe cut off. Did they buy or sell any land? And that's not actually the risk that you're responding to. So we've uh, we've tried to fix it by adding the stand back to 315 and then revising what's in uh, 330. Now, again, I'm expecting quite a bit of feedback regarding this uh, solution. Um, there were a number of board members who felt it was a double up to require the stand back as well as having this in 33018. Uh, there were also a number of members on the board who thought 33018 could just be removed, but we didn't have a clear view from the board. It was a little bit 50 50. So we've left them both in and we've asked respondents to the exposure draft to give us their view on what they think. We move on to the next slide where we talk about documentation. And really, this is trying to get people to think a little bit more around the documentation. So notwithstanding, there is a whole standard on documentation, which is ISA 230 that you can see there in the, in the orange box. Um, it's really trying to get people to think about um, documenting, I guess, where all of the judgments are being applied. So while we haven't made a lot of changes to the documentation requirements, in 315, we have enhanced some of them to really try and get people to think about what's the rationale behind my risk of material misstatement and documenting that thought process. And we expect that a number of the enhancements we've made to the requirements in ISA 315 will actually drive more documentation as well and drive more things into the ISA 230 requirement there that you'll see. If we move on to the next slide, I promise you I'm getting close to the end of my slides in case anyone's gone to sleep. Um, as I said, we like a bit of a roadmap at the IAASB, so we have a new roadmap as well talking about where are we headed to next, which is on that, that next <coughs> slide. The uh, exposure draft was approved in June, as I said. Comments close in November. And November the 2nd, in case any of you are people responsible for responding, that is the absolute latest. We um, we tried to leave it as open as long, for as long as we could, um, acknowledging that July, August is often a busy time for summer holidays for Europe and the US. Um, if we go any later than November the 2nd, though, I think as I explained at the start, we really will not be able to meet the deadline for getting to the December board meeting and then the March and the, the June board meeting. Meeting. And you may think, well, that's not, not the end of the world because it's only a three month slip if we do miss. The problem is that we'll then add a full 12 months to the Asian date. So um, if we don't get it approved in June at the June 2019 board meeting, we will really struggle to get it approved um, uh, in time for the 2020 application date that we're suggesting. And the other reason that that date is, uh, is important, as Rich explained, his standard is effective for 2019. Uh, mine, if, it, uh, if we can work through the responses and update the standard and have it issued, would be for 2020. And there are some jurisdictions, particularly some of the smaller jurisdictions, who would really like the two standards to be in, in place at the same time. And so some of those countries are considering holding off on the 2019 application date for 540 so they can match with 2020 for my, my standard of 315. So we really don't want 315 to slip if we can possibly um, possibly avoid it. So, um, so I think, Andre, that was probably the last slide. I don't think there were any more slides. Um, if you haven't had enough of 315, though, we are hosting another web Webinar. Oh no, there was one slide. I was with the date on it. I wasn't sure if that was in there, but we are hosting another webinar on um, October the third, seven thirty a seven o'clock in the morning New York time, which I think is is a very nice socially acceptable time for uh, for Europe and the UK. And uh, we'll host another session then, which will be much more question and answers than what obviously we've been able to do today. So um, if you have nothing else planned for that, that day, you're more welcome to. to connect in and, um, and, uh, and listen into that session as well. The details are on the, the IAASB website for anyone who is interested. And on that note, Andre, I will pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona and Rich. Uh, this was an extremely rich, uh, both, both presentations were extremely rich. I, I would like also to encourage uh, all participants 
either on behalf of institutions you represent or on your personal behalf, you can uh, go on, uh, on the website and respond to exposure draft uh, for the standard 315. Uh, and, um, and also I would like to, to open the Q&A session, which we, uh, according to the schedule, we have 10 minutes, but we can probably extend it slightly uh, if, if there will be more demand for questions. Uh, I will not go to specific sites, so you just need to speak up if you want to raise questions. Uh, I'm referring to uh, those connected in uh, country offices or those connected by Webex. Uh, those people who are on Webex can also type in the questions and we can read them here. Uh, so, uh, so please speak up if you have a, a particular question. So, Abbas uh, here has a question, please. Hi, uh, I have a question for Shako, and I, I just wanted to understand uh, the changes to ISA 540. And uh, I mean, based on what I've read, these are driven largely by IFRS 9 and the expected credit loss model uh, requirements, etc. Uh, what what prompted the approach to bring about a change in the standard, and and hence raise all these issues of scalability, which you've mentioned. Uh, and not go the route of an audit practice note, which is designed for a specific industry. So, uh, just just some, if you could just shed some light on the, on on the rationale for how the IASB has has approached this, uh, that would be really useful. Thank you. Sure, I'll I'll, I'll try to. So uh, again, um, it may be uh, the. Uh, basis of your question really was uh, at the original discussion about taking on a project uh, and uh, back in 2013-2014, it was um, thinking that we would do some sort of a practice note uh, trying to just uh, give some overall guidance of how to apply the standards. And I think, um, and we went down, uh, had many discussions, I, I, I would have to say um, um, those discussions moved very quickly once we started ta talking to the um, banking and insurance uh, regulators as well as the uh, regulated community as a whole um, that the, the changes that uh, were coming through the accounting side and it's not just IFRS 9 although that was the impetus but the uh, now we have IFRS 17 but IFRS 15 uh, plus the IFRS 3, there were you know, a, a lot of changes that uh, people thought um, right now you could just about get there based on uh, extant, but um, was it a rigorous approach? Was it a thorough approach? Um, was the documentation requirements um, really tied to the more complex uh, estimates that are being seen? Um, there was also a view that maybe the ISA 540 um, because in its title it was talking about fair values that people sort of thought it's only fair values that we're talking about. So there was a, uh, a view expressed and not, and then this moved beyond, so it started the impetus with the regulators, but beyond that when we started talking with uh, our wider group, which is called the, uh, the CAG, the Consultative uh, um, uh, Advisory Group, um, which has a, lots of different uh, uh, people on that group that started to say, you know, actually, if you're going to do this, why aren't you going to do this for all? Why is it just for banking institutions? Uh, IFRS 9 or insurance or, again, all these other standards affect all uh, accounting um, um, estimates. So really, should we do a holistic approach? And that's what the board uh, uh, decided when we came up with a, a proposal back in uh, 2015. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much, Rich. Um, colleagues, anybody else would like to raise a question, either here in the room or elsewhere, those connected? Um, I, I'll just use the opportunity that I have a microphone and I'll ask uh, uh, one general question to both Rich and Fiona. Uh, may, maybe you can share a little bit of your insights uh, on the preparations of uh, the, the new issued standard and also upcoming changes uh, to, the, to the standard uh, 315. 
so specifically how the methodologies will be updated, what kind of uh, training approaches are used, uh, or maybe some guidance issued or application examples uh, in your own firms that w w where you practice. So maybe uh, over to Fiona first and then to, to Rich. Sure. So if I talk very briefly about ISA 540, that, um, that's a really big piece of work. And when the standard came out as an exposure draft um, uh, last year, as Rich explained, all of the firms and certainly the, I guess, the big six or the big eight globally um, invested heavily in looking at the exposure draft and rewriting their guidance and running training, uh, not just for uh, financial services being banks, but obviously that was a, um, a primary focus given that the, the big four typically audit the global, um, you know, the global CIFIs, for example. Um, so we invested quite heavily in developing training at that time. Um, what we are now doing is, um, even though the exposure draft hasn't received um, I guess the blessing from the PIOB yet, we are in the process of updating the training, the guidance, the materials uh, to try and uh, roll that out as quickly as we can. The challenge we have is with the timing and, and also this final standard does look a little different to what the exposure draft had in it. So we are just trying to, um, to update that. And the other challenge we have is getting it embedded into the tools that uh, certainly EY use. We have an electronic tool to capture all of our working papers in, which I think all of the firms have one. Um, to try and get that updated can take a little longer to do. So the focus has been on getting, um, we call them smart forms. I don't think they're very smart. They're just forms that you can hide the guidance in or expand the guidance in. But the focus has been on getting those forms um, updated for this new standard to try and start to roll it out. So we have plans as a firm to run a significant amount of training starting in our, I have to think what part of the world I'm in now. So your spring next year, uh, my autumn, and uh, to roll those out. In terms of the uh, ISA 315, um, there's probably three parts of the firm that are focused on this at the moment. There's uh, leadership from an assurance perspective, there's the methodology teams, and then we obviously have uh, sort of standards team and the technology team as well. They are reviewing the exposure draft and they will respond to the exposure draft by the 2nd of November deadline or I will kill them. <laughs> but we'll at least get the deadline, which will be good and we'll get their feedback. Um, and then obviously we will work with that to, to work through, um, you know, what else we need to do differently. I think uh, EY will probably think they're in a fortunate position sometimes, sometimes an unfortunate position having, having me chairing the task force because I have been able to identify along the journey where some of the key uh, pain points for us as a firm will be. And I'm sure Rich being at the board table hearing the conversations has been able to identify the pain points for PwC if the standard was to be issued in its final form, the same as the exposure draft. But certainly the focus for the 315 is really on getting um, feedback from as many people globally within Ernst & Young to then draft the response to the exposure draft. So Rich, I don't know if you had any slightly different approaches that you're taking at PwC, but that's certainly the approach we're taking at, uh, at EY. Um, thanks, uh, Fiona, and, and, and largely, uh, you know, things are very similar. Um, and uh, just comment on the last point, uh, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, being the chair of 540 uh, was a blessing at times for the firm and, and at other times, uh, you know, where are you taking us? And I'm sure that's uh, probably similar to what Fiona uh, faces on 315. And, you know, um, uh, I would encourage uh, people to want to attend uh, the webcast that Fiona is doing in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, I thought the first one was very good, and, and I think this next one um, probably, I think, is based on questions, uh, more questions, and I think that would be very helpful. Um, where, you know, starting just with the, staying on with 315, uh, you know, just uh, you know, where we are is exactly, uh, as, as Fiona was saying, is trying to figure out where we, uh, how we want to respond to the, um, the uh, exposure draft, and we will be in, in by the second, no, no doubt. Um, and uh, today, actually, I'm in London uh, doing this uh, uh, WebEx, and, and 
actually started about uh, well, started in about 20 minutes uh, a, um, a a global um, you know uh, video conference within the firm is just talking exactly for the next uh, six seven hours on on where we think uh, uh, our positions should be initially on on you know the uh, uh, common letter so um, it, it's early stages but but one that you know I think uh, uh, we'll start ramping up to to get the common letter, and then obviously start thinking how uh, what things might stay and, and how that might change our methodology. Um, moving on to 540, um, you know, maybe the first thing is is um, you know this obviously has a big impact on financial and state institution uh, side of things, and and uh, the, the global firms uh, together, and then obviously individually um, worked on how uh, conceptually. You could apply the exposure draft and the thoughts in the exposure draft to auditing of the uh, estimates, primarily I plus nine. And there was a paper issued about a year ago uh, that that uh, tried to address that. So the firms themselves have have a, a high level of how to deal with this, and obviously brought that into methodology of some sort. The the, the key thing, and and this was one of the reasons uh, uh, that. Uh, the, the effective date was moved from the 15th of December 18 uh, to 15 of December 19. Was um, you know with that spring uh, rollout of methodology that most of the, at least the larger firms did use uh, comes along training, and it you know not only was it a thought that maybe it wouldn't work from a, uh, getting those smart tools ready. Uh, I think the methodology probably would be there, but then. Key is is would you have your people trained? Um, and since you know 540 and through and five eventually, you know, are ones that you do at the beginning of the audit. You've got to think about it because you said to your risk assessment, you have to deal with these things early. Um, so you know, I, I think um, you know, we are waiting for the standard to be finalized, but we're not waiting to you know, consider all the changes in methodology that ISO 540 requires and. And uh, globally, we're working on that, uh, and it's going to take a while, though. Andre? Thank, thank you so much, Rich. Uh, uh, colleagues, any other questions on the sides? Maybe. Uh, Uh, maybe I can uh, also ask uh, one more. Actually, I have two more questions, and then we can uh, also check our location. So, uh, the question: uh, What what is, in your opinion, um, and it's probably the question to both uh, Rich and um, Fiona: uh, What are the most difficult uh, and judgmental part of revisions? Uh, or both revisions that that will have difficulties in uh, application in practice. And the second question would be, uh, what would be the greatest benefits of revisions? And I'm more uh, referring to benefits of users, how users will perceive those changes and how they will uh, be more convinced that these uh, changes will lead to more rigorous uh, approaches in audits. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, there are Enhanced communication requirements with those charged in government, with governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, you know, sometimes it, these changes are so technical, so that it's difficult to deliver to, to users. And, and how uh, how this can um, possibly be better perceived? And what what are your views on this? Thanks. So maybe I'll start, uh, Fiona. Um, so. You know what's uh, what's maybe the most difficult or judgmental part. You know, um, I mean, clearly there's uh, there are lots of changes uh, both uh, in both uh, the three three one five ED and 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 the final standard that we have on five forty. Um, are there fundamental changes? You know, uh, and, you know it's really hard to say. I mean, I I think the main part is it's a more thorough standard and 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 Importantly, and obviously in both standards, I think, because it's, uh, it, it's a much more enhanced uh, consideration of a risk assessment. And, and I think that's the starting place for making sure you get your approach right. So I think that's probably the main thing that if you, if you really think about it. And I think the big, big engagements around the world from an ISO 540 perspective 
uh, we'll see changes. Um, but to a large extent, the ways we're going about this were, were thought about and, and discussed with those big, large engagements. So you know, for them, it's probably more clarity, documentation, and some, some things around the edges. For, for others around the world, I think it will be more because it will be a more focused, uh, you know, uh, audit on, on the key risks and what's driving the, 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 the risks that we have to audit. Um, the other area I'd say uh, on difficult is, is you know, as, as we look at um, uh, external information sources, and, you know, I think that is something that people have always wondered about. Uh, the uh, uh, PCOB came out with uh, some, some guidance, uh, and I think that is similar to, you know, they wanted to think about, you know, third-party pricing. We've taken a step further, but it's an area that is, uh, you know, right at that question, where, how far do you go? Um, we try to make it a little easier to understand how far you go, but but even then, there's still judgment has to be applied. And so I think that's still going to be a difficult area. Um, looking at the the um, greatest benefits, I think it, it it ties into that. I think it's again a more thorough understanding, a uh, more thorough look at what is truly driving the risk. You know, requirements are going to focus on on those various aspects of data um, uh, methods and assumptions, and I think that's going to help help uh, focus the audit down to the, that, that level and therefore allow, uh, allow a better understanding uh, of the components of what builds up into a, a uh, accounting estimate. Um, disclosures, as I said earlier, is, is, is hopefully going to be expanded to allow the readers to understand what, what came into these things. Uh, Fiona, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, so on... Uh on 540, just to reiterate what you've just said, Rich, I think, I mean, we as a firm will have some particular unique challenges just because of the way our methodology is designed, and I expect all of the firms will have some of those challenges. Um, and I think uh, that we are spending quite a bit of time looking at some of what seem like reasonably innocuous changes. Um, for example, you know, the, the responsibility around disclosures, it's changed from the word of the adequacy of disclosures to the reasonableness of disclosures. That causes us quite a bit of heartburn as a firm because we have we have to do quite a bit of work now around that. But if you take aside all of the things that are, I guess, methodology choices that we have made as a firm along the way, I think the biggest thing for us out of 540 will be that the new requirement, as you said, Rich, on the reliability of external information sources. Um, we currently don't have a lot of guidance in our methodology. Um, I think it'd be fair to say there's not a there's not a really strong um, framework for the work effort, which is in the standard, but they've left it to be flexible so the firms can design what makes sense for their methodologies. And I think also the other piece is that this applies across all ISAs, not just estimates. So that's the other thing that we're really trying to think through um, on, on 540. So that's um, that's certainly uh, what we're looking at in terms of the, the more challenging areas that have come through the revisions. Um, but totally agree with Rich's comments on, on where some of the improvements and enhancements will flow through. For 315, I think um, the way it's drafted at the moment, I think some of the more judgmental or, or, or challenging parts of the, re the revisions are certainly significant risks. So does that mean every risk is now significant risk? Um, or are there a few more? Um, which accounts are the significant ones? Which ones are the relevant assertions, for example? So I think there's a number of things that still allow for quite a bit of judgment for the auditors to be applied when they look at the when they look at this definition. I suspect firms will have to update their methodologies for these new definitions as well. And in terms of the greatest benefits, I think um, I think helping teams understand when they're doing their risk assessments, why do I care? Like, why do I actually care about getting an understanding of the entity, the business that it's doing, the environment that it's in, the fra reporting framework that it's in? You know, why do I care about the system of internal control, particularly if you're going to do a primarily substantive audit? So we've really tried to draw that out and really help people understand that while you may not get to take you know, credit, I say in inverted commas, for, for controls, if you haven't tested them, what you will have is by having this understanding and getting these understanding of the controls relative to the audit, you'll be able to design much better response to the audit. So you'll get a much better um, 
uh, substantive procedures being designed are much more tailored once you've got this understanding. So that's one thing. I think the enhancements around IT have been really important, um, not just in the business model, but in the system of internal control and really understanding how IT fits into the business and what are risks arising out of IT. So I think that's one of the big benefits coming out of this exposure draft. And then I also see a benefit in uh, no longer allowing auditors to make a choice of either performing a separate assessment or a combined assessment of inherent risk and control risk. I really do think that that going down the path of requiring separate assessments will mean that um, that we get um, we get a, a better risk assessment and therefore a more tailored response to the risks of material misstatement. Um, so I'll I'll pass it back to you, Andre, based on the, based on those comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona and Rich. Uh, colleagues, uh, any last call I can make uh, on, the, on the last question you may have? I don't see any questions on Webex and I don't see any sites speaking. So probably with this, we would like to close this session and uh, with sincere thanks to Rich and Fiona for rich presentations and for rich um, uh, conclusions and, uh, and guidance and also answering the questions. Uh, and without further ado, I'll pass back to Kalina for, for the next time. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona and Rich, also. Very interesting presentations and nice to hear about these changes. And I'm uh, uh, really interested to see what responses will come to the 315. So we'll follow that. Thank you very much. Fiona, I understand that you will sign off. It's getting pretty late at your location. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll catch up after this virtual event. No now problem. Thank me... you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thanks. So let me introduce myself for those who do not know me. I'm Kalina shukarova Sawska, and I'm uh, um, working for the Center for Financial Reporting Reform in Vienna. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate today this session, which is an update from the Ethics Board. As Nikia mentioned in her opening uh, remarks, uh, the Ethics Board recently completed a project which involved uh, rewriting and restructuring of the Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants. Uh, now the code, uh, the objective of this project was to make the code easier to navigate, use and enforce. And also it brought together all the recent developments in ethics and independence. The effective date for application of the new revised code is 15th June 2019. Today we have two speakers who will be uh, presenting jointly. I will briefly introduce each of them. And of course, you can read more about uh, their professional experience and their bios in the attached agenda to the invitation to this event. So we have Kim Gibson, who is a member of the Ethics Board since 2016. Kim is the Global Head of Risk Management and Independence for Grant Thornton International and is a partner with Grant Thornton LLP in the US. She is responsible for providing member firms with policy, guidance and training related to independence matters, oversight of the automated global independence system used to monitor financial interests, and the oversight of international relationship checking process designed to prevent the provision of prohibited non-audit services to an audit client and conflicts of interest. We also have with us, joining us from uh, Canada, I think, from uh, Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken, we have Brian Frederick, who is a member of the Ethics Board since the beginning of this year. He is also a member of the board's eCode task force and is a principal in a research standards and education consultancy firm that has shaped his work experience for over 20 years. Previous to this, Brian worked in education for CPA Canada and also in the Greater Vancouver Auditing Practice of KPMG LLP. Similar to the session that Andre was moderating, we will first hear from the presenters and then we will launch a short Q&A session. Without further ado, let me now hand over to Kim and to Brian. So Brian, Kim, over to you.
Oh, Kalina, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Brian and I are very excited to be here this morning and greetings from New York City. So Kalina, we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, it's a little, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, so for today, everyone, Brian and I will be going back and forth with respect to the presentation, both of us handling different areas. And of course, at the end, we're more than happy to take any questions that you may have. So before we get started, we thought it would be a good idea to explain why. Why did the IESBA take on a project, a many, many year project, to look at the code and to restructure the code? And over the last few years, it's been, been quite clear that there has been increased regular, regular, re, regulator um, requirements. There have been, as many know within the profession, breaches of independence, breaches of the code, questionable ethical activity for professional accountants. And the board was quite aware of that. We wanted to make sure that the code was one that was fit for purpose for today and ongoing. Also, there has been a lot of discussion about firms and their current business model or the model that firms are looking to go towards. And many firms are putting a lot of time and effort into their advisory um, practice which is fine, but there has been questions primarily again from regulators about how does that impact quality? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we talk about our fees project. But we wanted, and in addition, there have been practitioners, PAs, both, both in public and private, that felt the code needed a revision that the PAs in business found that the code was very audit centric um, and that it didn't really focus more on the areas that PAs in business were interested in. So it's important to understand that the board did hear you and as a result this project took place. So next slide please. Okay. I will just go quickly through the agenda that Brian and I will be going through with you today. In a, in a moment, I'm going to hand it over to Brian, where he will be giving you a IESBA 101. Um, how does the IESBA work? Who's on the IESBA? What, what is it, its mission? I think it's important for many folks in the audience to really understand what the board does. Um, I know everybody here understands that there is a board and it sets these ethical standards. But, but there's more to it, the makeup, the composition, the mission. And then we will go into the restructured code. How is the code restructured? And what are some of the real highlights with respect to the code itself? And finally, we will discuss the future of the board, some of the activities that we plan on um, embarking on in the next years. And um, specifically, we'll talk about, again, I mentioned fees, we'll talk about non-assurance services and professional skepticism amongst others. Technology is another area that we will cover. So with that, I'll hand that over, I'll hand it over to Brian um, and he can talk about the IS and the, and the makeup of the IS. So Brian. Thanks, Kim. So this is the uh, very brief IESBA 101. Uh, like our sister board, the IAASB, we are also an independent standard setting body that serves the public interest by setting robust and internationally appropriate, in our case, ethics standards, including auditor independence requirements for uh, professional accountants worldwide. Our board's principal output is the code of ethics uh, for professional accountants. Now, in terms of composition, I guess we're already on slide five. Uh, our board is comprised of 17 volunteer members that stem from all six of at least of the significantly inhabited continents, so other than Antarctica. Uh, there are currently five public members, eight practitioners, and four non-practitioners. 
And then our board is also chaired by a public member, uh, Stavros Tomadakis, at this point. Our members are appointed by the IFAC board, subject to the approval of the Public Interest Oversight Board. And then with respect to process, the uh, PIOB provides oversight and the Consultative Advisory Group provides advice. Both of these groups send representation to attend each of the meetings of the IESBA. Our standard setting process is founded on the open, transparent debate of issues, exposing all of the draft standards and other guidance documentation for public comment, and then a public discussion and consideration of the comments that are received and their disposition before our final standards are produced. Okay, on the next slide then. So a key benefit of such a rigorous and open process is the IESBA's uh, code's very widespread adoption around the world, being used uh, directly or as the foundation for ethics codes in more than 120 countries, as well as being adopted by forum of firms for their transnational audits. Translations for the code exist in 39 languages, and it's really the resultant predictability in expectations and accountability created by these norms for professional accountants and the related economic impact of promoting high ethics standards and requirements that cannot be overstated. So next slide then for Kim on the revised and restructured code. So I, I do have the privilege of chairing the implementation of the new code working group and it is made up myself some other board members along with a technical advisor and supported, of course, by the IESBA staff. And our job really is to help lead the messaging and the um, visibility of the new code with our stakeholders. Um, we do try to help organize guidance that is available. We are involved in outreach, such as, as this webcast. And we're really looking to get the word out with respect to the code. So the new code, the revised new code, it has been completely rewritten. I'm not sure if people have had the opportunity to see the new code. It will be available shortly in hard copy. Um, but the design really was made to allow our um, PAs to navigate with ease, to be able to determine the requirements as opposed to other guidance within the code. And as you will see, each section has an introduction. There are the requirements that are denoted by an R and very, very visible. And then there is application material underneath each requirement. The code also has a user guide in front that helps the PAs navigate the code, which section is where, what section may be appropriate, um, and also a discussion about the beginnings of the code where a full discussion regarding the fundamental principles and the conceptual framework um, is placed with the acknowledgement that that section and those topics or those concepts really need to be included with everything that is done within the code. So if you are looking professional accountants business or independent section, it's really important to understand that the conceptual framework and um, the fundamental principles need to be embedded and work together. Um, the code, the new name for the code, it's a bit lengthy. There's been some debate on whether it should have been shortened, but nonetheless, the new code's name is International Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants, including international independent standards. And I do believe the title was an attempt to acknowledge, of course, number one, that there are independent standards included, but also the fact that it is a code of ethics first and foremost. Um, there also is another big initiative with respect to an e-code. Stakeholders have made it very clear that in this day and age, they are looking for an opportunity to go online and be able to really use the code in a way where there are hyperlinks, there are drill downs, 
um, that you can search a topic and be able to find all the information and literature regarding that topic. So the plan as of now is for the e-code to be available once or at the point when the standards are effective. So that would be in June of 2019. Next slide, please. Thank you. So aside from the restructuring, what else is included in the new code? The new code has significant revisions to it, including, as I discussed before, the conceptual framework. The concept conceptual framework, along with the fundamental principles, have been um, repositioned, have been highlighted. A discussion about the conceptual framework we'll have in, in a little bit, but that was a significant, the prominence of the conceptual framework and fundamental principles and how they relate to all professional accountants is really one of the main highlights of the revised code. And of course, we've had several projects that are included in the revised code. They include the no class standard, the, the non-compliance with laws and regulations, um, fondly called no -clar. The long association provisions, we have a new section on inducements and public accountants and professional accountants, sorry, in business, there is a revised section regarding preparing um, financial statements. In the code, there's no CLAR, long association. There is, um, there was a project on safeguards, so there will be some revisions regarding safeguards, specifically in section uh, 600. There is also new guidance regarding professional judgment and professional skepticism. The next slide, please. So this slide, I think we might have lost it. There we go. This, this slide denotes the architecture of the revised code. So there are four distinct sections of the code, very different from where the previous code um, was. So part one includes a discussion regarding the conceptual framework as well as the fundamental principles. To refresh everybody's memory, um, the fundamental principles include integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, professional competence and due care, and professional behavior. The fundamental principles have not changed. Part two is the section devoted to professional accountants in business. And this is a big change, if nothing else, to move the guidance and requirements for the PAIBs up front into the code. There was significant feedback about the fact that the guidance and requirements were previously at the end of the book, if you will. Um, and and it was really lost that information. So what we tried to do was move it up front into the code so that professional accountants in business really can find what they're looking for. It comes after part one, the discussion of conceptual framework, along with the fundamental principles, and hopefully just the locality of it really helps professional accountants in business understand the connection between part one and part two. Part three includes um, the guidance regarding conflicts of interest, fees, no CLAR, as it relates to professional accountants in public practice, as well as part 4A and B, which are primarily the independent standards. Note that there is no part four, it's part 4A and B. Um, that was the decision of the board to, to lay it out that way. So we're not missing a part four, it is part one, two, three, four A and four B. And then at the end, we do have the glossary, which includes some additional terms that um, we have accumulated as a result of the project over the last few years. Brian? Thanks, so on to the next slide then, please. So the, the threats to compliance with the fundamental principles and to independence are unchanged in the revised and restructured code, and they 
continue to fall into one or more of five different categories, as you can see in the slide here. So very briefly, uh, self-interest threat is the threat that a financial or other interests will inappropriately influence a professional accountant's judgment or their behavior. A self-review threat is effectively the, the threat created by reviewing one's own work or the work of another individual within the accountant's firm or employing organization on which the accountant will rely when they're forming a judgment as part of uh, the work that they're currently performing. Uh, advocacy threat is the threat that a professional accountant will promote a client's or their employing organization's position to the point that the accountant's objectivity is compromised. A familiarity threat is the threat that results from a long or a close relationship with the client or employing organization in that the professional accountant becomes too sympathetic to their interests uh, or too accepting of their work. And then finally, uh, intimidation threat is the threat that a professional accountant will be deterred from acting objectively because of some actual or perceived pressures, including attempts to exercise undue influence over that professional accountant. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So the fundamental principles establish the, the standard of behavior that's expected of professional accountants, and they reflect the profession's clear recognition of its public interest responsibility. So as I mentioned previously, and, and, uh, and as Kim also mentioned, the fundamental principles remain unchanged. And so has the overarching requirement for all professional accounts to apply the conceptual framework to comply with these fundamental principles. One thing to note is that independence is not a fundamental principle, but rather the categories of threats to independence that we saw in the previous slide are the same as those to the fundamental principles, and hence you see the connection here. So therefore, the, the code clarifies, and it, and it now actually explicitly states that the conceptual framework applies to compliance with independence in the same way that it does to compliance with the fundamental principles more generally. So on the next slide, Kim is going to discuss some of the key enhancements to the conceptual framework. Thank you, Brian. So as we mentioned, there was a lot of work done on the conceptual framework. And the circle, if you, you see on your slide, tries to illustrate the, the process of identifying threats, evaluating threats, and then addressing threats. And during that process, there's an expectation that member firm, I'm sorry, that, that professional accountants would use professional judgment, would continue to remain alert throughout the engagement with respect to any additional threats that, that may appear, and then whether or not the threats that have been identified are actually at an acceptable level. If they are not at an acceptable level, then the threats must be addressed. And there are three ways that threats that are not at an acceptable level can be addressed. One is to eliminate the circumstances creating the threat. For example, we may have a threat as a result of a financial interest in an audit client. You would be able to eliminate those circumstances by potentially having the audit partner or someone on the audit team um, sell those financial interests. So eliminating the circumstances. The next would be to apply safeguards. And then finally, if the two other two are not realistic and the level is still unacceptable, there would be an expectation that the professional accountant would de not decline or end the service. So the process itself does require now a step back once, dress, one, once threats have been addressed. And if there's new information that comes into play, the professional accountant must take a step back and reevaluate, so go through the cycle again. The conceptual framework section of the code does introduce new terms. We'll go through them quickly. I, I won't go through them in, in detail, but also talks about safeguards and aligning the safeguards to specific threats, so the threats that Brian 
just spoke about, the code has attempted to try to identify appropriate safeguards for specific threats. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll go this just, just quite quickly. We have some new terms. I will just highlight four new terms that are in, four new or revised terms that are in um, the code. So one is safeguards and the definition of safeguards. And I will just read this to you, but I think, I think it's probably the best way to do it. Actions individually or in combination that the professional accountant takes that effectively reduces threats to compliance with fundamental principles to an acceptable level. So that is a much more robust definition of safeguards than we've had in the past. In addition, we now have the concept of conditions, policies, and procedures. This is new. It is not a safeguard. They are not normally safeguards. Um, although previously one may have thought a condition or a policy could be considered a safeguard. So what the board really tried to do was acknowledge that there may be conditions, policies, or procedures in place that can help mitigate or reduce the threat. But if there is still a threat at an acceptable level, a safeguard most likely would need to be put in place. So the, the concept gets a bit confusing and, and it does take a little time to understand the difference between a condition policy procedure versus a safeguard. And I'll do my best to, to explain as we go forward and talk a little bit more about safeguards. But for example, a condition policy procedure could in fact be firm policies and procedures around certain um, aspects of the audit. So there are requirements for an engagement quality reviewer that obviously code, the code requires. However, firms may in fact have policies and procedures above and beyond that. Um, corporate governance requirements, training requirements, those types of um, policies, procedures would be considered conditions and not necessarily a safeguard. The way we, we have been trying to define it is that a safeguard is really very specific to the situation at hand, as opposed to perhaps this overarching requirement for training or corporate governance. The next slide, please. Definition of acceptable level, a level at which a professional accountant uses the reasonable and, and informed third party tests that would likely conclude the PA complies with the fundamental principles. So again, the concept of acceptable level. Reasonable and, and informed third party tests. This may be the most expensive paragraph, I would say, in the code we spent, or at least with respect to hours of the board and staff working on it, in addition to the comments that we have received from our stakeholders. There was a lot of discussion about um, the RIPP tests. And I think what we want to take away is that this is a concept used throughout the code. It's important for PAs to understand what a reasonable and informed third party is. And the definition here is a reasonable informed third, the reasonable th informed third party test is a concept which involves consideration by the PA about whether the same conclusions would likely be reached by another party. And that other party, there was a lot of discussion about who is that other party? Is it another accounting? Is it another accountant? Is it the man on the corner or is it somewhere in between? And ultimately, the board agreed that it does, the, the reasonable person does not need to be a professional accountant, but needs to be somebody that possesses a relevant knowledge and experience to understand and evaluate the appropriateness of the PA's decisions. So it is not the man on the street, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the professional accountant. Um, again, really important concept within the code. And you will see it throughout the code in the various sections, accountants in business as well as in public practice. Brian, I'll hand over to you the NOCLAR and we'll, we'll discuss a little, chat a little bit about NOCLAR. 
Thanks. So on uh, slide 16, another relatively recent addition to the code is the NOCLAR standard, a standard that was the result of over six years of very extensive multi-stakeholder consultation. Now, NOCLAR sets out what is really a, a first of its kind framework to guide professional accounts in what actions to take in the public interest when they become aware of a potentially uh, illegal act known as non-compliance with laws and regulations that is committed by a client or by an employer. The standard uh, came into effect just over a year ago, as you can see, and includes a, a clear pathway to disclose uh, NOCLAR to appropriate public authorities in certain circumstances that are based on the professional accountant's role. So there's really four different roles that this looks at with a, a proportionately different uh, response and, and disclosure uh, pathway. So it could be that the individual is an auditor or they're another uh, professional accountant in public practice otherwise, or that they're a senior level professional accountant in business, and then finally, an other professional accountant in business. The sorts of laws and regulations that the standard targets are those that have a direct effect on material amounts or disclosures in the financial statements, and also those that may be fundamental to an entity's business and operations. So for example, things like uh, fraud, bribery, corruption, uh, money laundering, and, uh, and terrorist financing, uh, tax laws, uh, environmental protection laws, or health and safety, and, and so on. Okay, let's move to the next slide then. So this slide, uh, simply provide some information on the current state of adoption of the NOCLAR standard in some jurisdictions. It also highlights that the IESBA and IFAC's Compliance Advisory Panel are expected to collaborate in a survey ahead of the planned NOCLAR post-implementation review uh, that's planned for uh, 2021. Okay, and then on the next slide, So section 220, a, uh, a substantive revision for professional accounts in business is this revised section 220. Uh, this section provides more comprehensive provisions that address a professional accounts responsibilities when they're preparing and presenting information. So for example, through prohibiting discretion that has the intent to mislead or inappropriately influence decision makers of contractual or regulatory outcomes. So for instance, an example would be using an unrealistic estimate with the intention of avoiding violation of some contractual requirement, such as a debt covenant, or perhaps of a regulatory requirement. So something like a capital requirement for a financial institution. Section also enhances guidance to assist professional accountants in dissociating themselves from this kind of misleading uh, or inappropriately influential uh, information. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Section 270, uh, this recognizes that pressure that's exerted both on or by a professional accountant might create an intimidation or other threat to compliance with one or more of the uh, fundamental principles and consequently, it sets out specific requirements and guidance application material that's relevant to applying the conceptual framework in such circumstances. There's certainly a recognition that uh, pressure is out there. We see that in numerous surveys in the business world, uh, in particular, that professional accounts are, are receiving, are on the receiving end, particularly of a lot of this kind of pressure. So there's uh, some significant guidance in here. And, in terms of how to deal with that kind of pressure. Yeah, on slide 20, there's numerous examples of such pressure that are provided. These are included in the standard under the categories that are shown here on this slide. Uh, some specific situations might be the pressure to report misleading financial results to meet investor, analyst, or lender expectations. Uh, the pressure from a family member that's bidding on uh, the ability to act as a vendor to the professional accountant's employing organization and the pressure to select that family member over another prospective vendor or perhaps 
pressure that's received from superiors to approve or process expenditures that really aren't legitimate business expenditures. So some examples of guidance for professional accountants faced with such pressure include discussing that matter with the source of the pressure, trying to address the situation at its root, or if that uh, fails, then perhaps approaching one supervisor or further escalating the matter to the audit committee or those charged with governance, uh, dealing with legal counsel and so on. Throughout the, the situation, it's strongly encouraged that uh, professional accountants document the situation and, uh, and its attempted resolution throughout. Okay. On the next slide, 21, please. So the inducement sections, uh, sections 250 for professional accountants in business and 340 for professional accountants in public practice comes into effect next year. Uh, the important additions here clarify the appropriate boundaries for professional accountants for both offering and accepting inducements. Note that there's a full prohibition on offering or accepting inducements that have the intent to improperly influence behavior and also a requirement to apply the conceptual framework when there is no actual or perceived intent to improperly influence behavior. And the final point on this slide simply notes that there are also some conforming amendments that we made to the independent standards uh, in sections 420 and 906 specifically that relate to gifts and hospitality. And I will pass over to Kim to talk about some of the other substantive revisions. Thank you, Brian. So what we'll talk about now are some of the more substantive substance revisions in sections one through four. And in section one, we did make revisions to the application material with respect to professional judgment and professional skepticism. There are no new requirements as of now with respect to both, but in fact, application materials. And with respect to all professional accountants, there is an emphasis in the importance of understanding all of the facts and circumstances when exercising professional judgment judgment. Um, again, application materials. With respect to auditors, we do talk about professional skepticism and how auditors and other assurance practitioners need to comply with the fundamental principles to support professional skepticism. We'll talk a little bit more when we, we talk about ongoing activities for the board about the um, ongoing professional skepticism discussion. So uh, next slide, please. OK, a, a, a new piece or a, a new concept within the code is there's guidance clearly in professional accountants in business versus professional accountants in public practice. And through many commenters and board discussion, it became clear that some of the guidance may overlap outside of the conceptual framework and fundamental principles. And what we really noted is that with respect to the requirements for professional accountants in business, they may be true for certain professional accountants in public practice. So got Brian talked about some of the requirements around pressure and then there's conflicts of interest and sufficient expertise that surround professional accountants in business. However, a professional accountant in public practice may also be acting as an accountant in business in certain, certain circumstances. And this can happen if in fact that PA is a contractor or is an employee um, or even an owner of a firm. So within my organization, for example, as I'm sure many, we have in the United States, we're CPAs. We have CPAs, we have practitioners that would be re required to follow the code, 
but are in a CEO or CFO role or a controller role. So the thought is that they are not necessarily an accountant in public practice, but many of the requirements regarding the PAIB would be applicable. So new concept. Um, I think what, during some of the board discussions, many of the board members always felt that that was there in the code. However, it was not explicit. And now we've had the opportunity to really make, make it very clear that, um, that professional accountants in public could actually um, be required to adhere to some of the requirements as those for professional accountants in business. Okay. Next slide, please. Another revision, which many of you I'm sure are um, familiar with, was the revision to long association. This project took some time. There were many, many board discussions way before I joined the board. There were round tables as a result of long association and what is the right answer with respect to primarily the cooling off period. So previously the code had a two year cooling off period for all key audit partners, engagement partner, quality reviewer, any other partner, it was a two year cooling off. Um, as especially the EU regulations came about and there was uh, quite a lot of discussion regarding partner rotation, firm rotation, and other jurisdictions around the globe that had more restrictive cooling off periods, it, it really became clear to the board that we needed to go back and revisit this. And since we did, there were revisions to the code and the specifics regarding primarily the cooling off period. So the um, time on period remains at seven years. And um, it was seven years in the extant code, it is seven years in the new code. As I noted, Two years was the cooling off period for all, all key audit partners. That has changed. So the engagement partner now has a five year cooling off period. The quality review partner has a three year cooling off period and all other partners would have a two year cooling off period. It's important to note also that there are restrictions around the cooling off period. Um, any technical consultations with a partner, whether it's the engagement partner or the quality review partner that is in their cooling off time is prohibited. So no technical discussions when a partner is on their cooling off period. Um, there's also a prohibition on acting as the client relationship partner as Many of us know in, in the recent year or so, there have been enforcement actions as a result of these close associations and the independence ramifications. So the code now prohibits any type of client relationship um, with the partner that is cooling off. There are also some additional revisions in um, the, the introductory or the general provisions which has really made it clear that whether it's a private entity or a public entity, the professional accountant must look at long, the, the association and the, the corresponding threats to having a long association. And with respect to private entities, there are no specific cooling off periods, but there is a requirement that the professional accountant assesses independence and whether or not there may be an issue with respect to how long the tenure may be of the engagement partner, a potentially a quality review partner, or even any staff person on the engagement. Um, the effective date for long association is December 15th of 2018. So I know many firms, if they have not, are in the process of looking at the standard, determining what they need to do, do to comply, whether it's a domestic firm or if the firm has international affiliates, how does that work? And making sure that the cooling off periods are complied with. 
There are clearly, as you can imagine, some additional complexities when you have a partner who may be an engagement partner for a certain amount of time, might go to the um, quality review partner role. So the code does go into some of those specifics and complexities and provide some guidance. Okay, next, next slide, please. Another topic or area where there was significant revisions was the non-assurance service section, NAS, and it's now section 600. Um, this was, again, I would say two year project, two plus years to look at the section and primarily look at it with respect to safeguards. So within the non-assurance section, there is a link back to the conceptual framework and the fundamental principles and helps identify or clarify how to identify, evaluate, and then address any threats that have been identified as a result of providing a non-assurance service to an audit client. Um, the prohibitions are much more prominent. Again, as, as we noted earlier, the requirements are denoted with an R and any prohibition would be included in a requirement. So that's the, the, the structure of, of the revised code. So a prohibition is easily identified. Um, there is some application regarding materiality and how to evaluate and, and address the threats with respect to materiality. There are additional discussions regarding safeguards, which are linked to the threats. So, for example, if there is a self-review threat by performing a valuation, the code now will link self-review threat to providing valuation services and then what could be an acceptable safeguard. So normally the safeguards that, that we talk about are having somebody outside of the engagement team review the procedures or having somebody that, um, again, is not on the engagement team for the most part providing those services. Those are pretty standard safeguards for self-review threats. So what the board and the task force tried to do was identify the threats associated with the non-assurance services that are included in the code. They have not changed with, with respect to the listing of the non-assurance services. So of course we have management, management responsibilities, administrative services, uh, I'm sure I'll forget some, um, valuations, tax, legal, corporate finance, and recruiting, which we will talk about and recruiting services, and this, there's probably some others that I left out, as I said, and really try to associate the threat of those services and then what would be the appropriate safeguard. And again, as we said earlier, if in fact we cannot get the acceptable, the level of the threat to being acceptable, the PA needs to determine whether there are any safeguards, if they can eliminate the threat or potentially decline the services. Next slide, please. So with respect to the non-assurance services, where I believe we made the most significant revision is with respect to recruiting services. And previously, there were specific prohibitions with respect to PIs, public interest entity. And the board took a look at this section as, as we did with every section and, and talked a lot about these recruiting services and should in fact the prohibitions be not only for PIs, but for all, all audit clients. And we kept on asking ourselves, what would be the safeguards? What would be the appropriate safeguards, even in a private audit, that we could apply to some of the services that would be provided, that, that have historically and traditionally been provided? And after quite a lot of discussion and consultation um, with various stakeholders regarding this, it was determined that we would prohibit certain 
recruiting services for all audit engagements. Um, so what is prohibited, what is prohibited is searching or seeking out candidates on behalf of your audit client, undertaking reference checks of prospective clients, and of course, negotiating salaries, um, compensation packages, those would all be taking on management type responsibilities and prohibited. Um, and it's prohibited for any director or officer positions and other positions where um, the candidate would be considered management and exert significant influence over the preparation of client records or financial statements. So a big change. And I'm, I'm being prompted with respect to timing. So I'll try to go through the effective dates quite quickly. Um, next slide, please. So the effective dates for the new code, primarily June 15th, 2019 for the sections, um, some, some nuances there, but primarily January 15th, 2019, no CLAR and long association do remain with their, with their effective dates. No CLAR is applicable, is effective. It was as of July 15th. 2017, so it's a year already, year plus, and long association, as we discussed, will be December 18th. Um, next page. Some of the tools available to you with respect to the new code, please, please, please go to the Ethics Board website. There is a page dedicated to the restructured code. There's all kinds of good stuff there. There are presentations. There is a one page flyer that if you wanted to provide to others that give you um, just really a, a bird's eye view of the changes in the code, very, very high level, but I think quite impactful. There are bases of conclusions. We have articles, Q and A's. There are videos that are available on specific topics. So one-stop shopping, as we note here, but there, there is really quite a lot of information that can help you. And we will continue over the next year to add to that page. Quickly, the next, the next page, this is where I, I beg, how, uh, implore all of you to get involved in however you can to help us spread the word of the new code. The board is doing the very best we can. We are limited in our ability to reach out to everyone, but there is a role for firms, for member organizations, governments, um, professional accountants and business, those charged with governance, on and on and on. There is a role for everyone to play in help socializing the new code. Um, with that, take a look at the time. Quickly, I know Brian was going to talk to you about what's next. And I think I was going to have a piece in there too about what's next for the board. So in this next section, we're going to provide some information about the IESBA's work on its future strategy and work plan. So if we can flip to slide 31 then. Uh, back in April of this year, a consultation paper was released with respect to the strategy and work plan for, for the 2019 through 2023 period. And this detailed the aim of fulfilling two distinct broad goals. So namely that IESBA and the code maintain its relevance and applicability in a world of rapid change. It's probably obvious to everyone. And also strengthening both its public interest objectives and trust in the accountancy profession as an integral whole. The comment period for this concluded in July, so it just ended and the board is going to be considering respondents feedback at our September meeting. So obviously then later this month. Uh, finalization of the strategy and work plan is anticipated by the end of this year. On the next slide, there's a number of projects to which the IESBA is pre-committed because these remain in process or they were established under the existing work plan that we're operating under. So those pre-commitments are shown on the slide and we're also going to cover off some of these updates for a sample of these over the next few slides. Okay, we'll move on to slide 33. 
And then beginning with the E code, uh, this project is tied to the release of the revised and restructured code with the intent of providing professional accountants as, well, as well as other stakeholders with an innovative way to access the code electronically. Some of the features that are being advanced include helping users better navigate and search and use the code in ways that reinforce the deliberate building blocks structure that has been put together with the revised and restructured code. This project arose directly from stakeholder requests to enhance the facilitation of learning, compliance, and enforcement of our code. Uh, the plan is to have the e-code online no later than uh, June 2019, which will coincide, as you can see, with the effective date of the revised and restructured code. And Kim's going to continue on the next slide with fees. Thanks, Brian. So what we do have on our agenda is um, the continuing discussion regarding fees. The code does have requirements and guidance with respect to audit fees. It primarily focuses on a significant audit client and how that could impact independence with respect to a firm, an office, or a partner. Um, but where this project is going is really looking at how the fees of non-assurance services could impact materiality. We did commission an academic out of New Zealand, I believe, that provided us some research regarding fees and how they're looked at across the globe. And we, there will be a proposal at the September meeting, which will be happening in two weeks, to actually bring this working group discussion and research and um, suggestions to a project task force level. The, the, the project will more likely than not, I haven't seen the paper yet, but will focus on looking at non-assurance services and how the level could impact independence. We did talk about this topic during the roundtables. The IESBA held four roundtables and two topics were talked about. One was non-assurance services, along with um, professional skepticisms and fees did come up with respect to discussion in the non-assurance service and whether there should be a cap i don't think that that really will be something that iesba will focus on but how do we manage and look at non-assurance services and fees associated with them for our audit clients uh, next slide please I just mentioned the working, um, I'm sorry, the roundtables. I won't go into too much detail. Had four of them. We discussed non-assurance services, professional skepticism, and the way forward for the board. So next slide. With respect to non-assurance services, it, it's pretty clear that, the, that there, there's kind of um, a bit of a struggle with respect to how do we manage them? Of course, we want to be in a position where we can have a code that we're able to harmonize with other codes around the globe, um, that we can have a code that is principle-based. However, when you start talking about non-assurance services, there are most definitely some stakeholders that believe we should have rules around specific services. So we're finding ourselves trying to, to determine what the balance is. And there will be a project proposal brought next two weeks to the board with respect to moving forward with non-assurance services. I happen to be on the working group, which more likely than not will turn into a task force after, um, after, the, after the meeting. So next slide, please. Just, just to give you an idea of some of the issues that we will be looking at as the project moves forward. Materiality, and how does that come into play when looking at non-assurance services? Should materiality be a factor? Um, primarily within our PI arena, materiality is a factor. In private audits, not necessarily. But where, where does that fall? 
And then pi versus non-pi, should there be a distinction? Should pies have more restrictive rules as opposed to non-pies? If there is a threat, is it really any different between a pie and a non-pi? Um, new and emerging services, is section 600 appropriately laid out so that it can be a long lasting section in the code that can encompass um, new, new technology, new services. And then also disclosure is another topic that has come up. Um, with respect to non-assurance services, many regulators across the globe do have a requirement to either receive approval or at least disclose non-audit non services that are being provided to their audit client. So the board will be looking at that um, issue as well and make some determinations and recommendations with respect to these areas. And then lastly, with respect to moving forward, we talked a lot about professional skepticism. I know Rich talked about professional skepticism in the audit arena. We have a lot of discussion about it. Um, again, there will be a paper going to September with respect to professional skepticism. There is a working group that talked about professional skepticism at the round tables. There were quite a lot, there was a, quite a lot of discussion about the term. Do we keep the term? Do we use a different term? Do we even need to include additional information in the code or is guidance appropriate? Um, perhaps some additional application material, perhaps the thought of wraparound guidance, if you will, with respect to professional skepticism. Critical mindset is a term that's been used. So a lot of discussion there. So you'll see some activity in, in this space for sure. Brian? Thanks, Kim. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see that there are a number of proposed initiatives in the 2019 to 23 strategic or uh, strategy and work plan. Uh, these are initiatives that arose out of both the IESPA's internal planning process, uh, together with specific feedback and suggestions received from other stakeholders through direct consultation as well as their input. Uh, as mentioned, additional consultative response review on these initiatives and on the prioritization and timing of these initiatives is going to take place as part of the IESPA's September meeting to help us finalize this plan uh, going forward. And then on the next slide, so just to highlight one of the initiatives that has already been launched, a working group related to technology was established at the end of last year. Uh, this group has a focus on enhancing the IESBA's working knowledge of various new and emerging technologies and in particular with a view to identifying the ethical implications that may be created as a result of their use by professional accounts in both uh, business and public practice settings. Uh, this group is also meeting again later this month. So that's a pretty important group because uh, it, it's at the very opening stages of looking at the types of ethical implications that can arise from a very broad uh, range of technological issues. Okay, and then if we can move to the next slide, we'll be, I think, in a position now to take questions at this time. And uh, Kalina, I'll let you uh, take over the facilitation of that process. Thank you, Brian, very much. Thank you, Kim, for your excellent presentations. Let me now open the question and answer session. We have a few minutes for a few incoming questions. So let me call to the VC locations and to the participants joining us through WebEx for any questions they may have for Kim and Brian. While we are waiting for questions, let me start with one uh, question for both. And this is relating to providing some guidance to the participants and to the professional accountancy organizations who are joining us today. Uh, Kim uh, and Brian, uh, the code becomes effective in approximately 10 months uh, and uh, as we can see from your presentations, there are quite a few changes, revisions, rewritings. So can you share with us uh, some information on your opinion 
as to what and also very important when PAOs can start doing something to help their members become more familiar with these changes and to uh, uh, be able to, to um, uh, educate them on what they are. And also if you can share some examples of what is going on in your PAOs and uh, in your firms uh, uh, regarding getting uh, 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 professionals ready to apply the changes. So over to you, Kim and Brian. Brian, do you want me to... I don't mind fielding that one first. Okay, great. So for me, I think there's probably two main points of action. Uh, obviously, it's going to be important for PAOs to help get the message out about the revised and restructured code to their members and also to other stakeholders. So that would be groups like government representatives, uh, other legislative uh, actors, and then other regulators. Uh, Certainly making reference to the IESBA website and uh, the resources that Kim uh, and her group is putting out with respect to uh, launching this uh, revised and restructured code. So again, there's a number of different resources between the brochure material, uh, explanatory material, the basis for conclusions of the different uh, revised sections and so on and new sections, uh, and then also videos, etc. So there's a lot of resources available I think another important aspect is for those jurisdictions that hard code a particular version of the IESBA code into their national statute, this would be a very appropriate time to advocate for the updating of that legislation or the regulation to ensure that it references this 2018 version of the code. And hopefully through this seminar and, and through some of the resources on the IESBA site, uh, we've provided sufficient encouragement for why such a move really is essential to both uh, to be up to date and also to take advantages of the benefits of the revised and restructured code. Uh, and, and in terms of timing, your, your question there, I, I think as soon as possible, you know, any time is a good time to be advising members. This is obviously a fairly significant change with respect to the code. And so getting that message out early, getting it out often is important. Uh, if, if, if you're looking for just an example, uh, within CPA Canada, communication uh, with members of, of the new sections and the requirements has been ongoing for nearly a year already. I expect this is going to continue uh, to promote the highest standards of ethical conduct and also for fair enforcement. It's essential to get that word out. And one of the things that we do in Canada is a mandatory ethics CPD requirement for members. And it would be this type of information update that would form a part of that triannual training to ensure that uh, members are kept up to date with respect to ethics uh, code changes and so on. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Kim, do you want to uh, add to Brian's uh, um, uh, discussion? I, I think, thank you. I think Brian really did cover it. I can say from my perspective of being with a global network firm that we are looking at the changes in the code and are looking at our policies and procedures to determine whether or not there needs to be revisions to them based on the code and actually where those revisions need to be. We are doing in-house training with respect to no CLAR and long association, and then an overview of um, changes to the code similar to what we've done today. So from a firm perspective, it's very, very important to make sure that your PAs do understand the changes and how they will impact them and their audit clients or, the, or their clients, I should say. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Brian. Let me just uh, re-emphasize and echo what you just uh, shared with us. Uh, this is the resources available on the website of the Ethics Board. I recently visited the, the pay web page. It has been refreshed with a lot of materials. Uh, I especially found very, very useful the one-page flares, which are very easy to, to look at, to read and to absorb and give a very nice overview of the key messages uh, that, that they are talking about. So I recommend that uh, 
uh, you do visit those resources and spend some time looking of what is useful and what can be uh, helpful for uh, uh, educating further your members uh, about the changes in the code. Let me thank Rich, Fiona, Kim and Brian for the excellent presentations. Let me also thank everybody who joined us today uh, for their participation and for the questions. Uh, let me mention that this distance learning event is being recorded and an edited recording will be shared with uh, the registered participants and it will be also made available on our web page. The presentations will also be shared following this event. Let me use this opportunity also to advertise the next virtual workshop under the EU Reparis program which will provide an update from the IFEX Small and Medium Practices Committee and especially it will include an update from the Global SMP Survey. As well, we will hear also about some recent tools and resources available for small practitioners. This event is scheduled to take place in a few weeks on September 25th. I'm looking forward to see you then. With that, let me wish everybody a good afternoon and thank you and goodbye.